Welcome. Thank you for coming today. This talk is called A Needle in a Haystack, How to Find a Threat Hidden in Over 6 Billion Logs Per Day. That'll make a little bit more sense here as we dive in. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Brian Davis. I'm a principal software engineer at a company called Red Canary based in Denver, Colorado. I'm a, I'm a part of their software architecture team. Um, I personally have been building really, really big distributed systems for a, a long time now. And so it's kind of the thing that I love to do and I love to geek out about. And if you guys want to talk with me afterwards, I'll dive in and, and geek out about that with anybody. Um, as a side note, I'm, I'm an avid hiker, photographer, home automator, and beekeeper. Uh, and I'm also based in the Denver area. So with that, let me dive into this. All right, so I'm assuming you're here because you want to find threats in your cloud environment, right? I think so. Cool, let's talk about what that actually means and we're gonna dive into that in a little bit more detail. So when I say a threat in your cloud environment, what am I talking about? I'm talking about things like unauthorized pod access, credential uh, abuse, API abuse, uh, unauthorized access to the resources within your cloud environment, data exfiltration, those types of, of um, detections and things, threats that we wanna find in our cloud environments, whether those are Kubernetes, whether that's in your native cloud environment. So what I'm gonna do today is talk about how Red Canary does this, right? This is kind of how we built our system. This is one of the things that we do, but I wanna share with you the process that we go through and how we break that down into the digestible chunks. So if you guys wanna go out and build your own, you can, right? This is not the way to do it. This is a way to do it, right? And there's a bazillion different ways that you can go out and solve this problem, right? You could go out and acquire a SIM. You could go out and build your own data lake. You could use a, a bunch of different tools out there. I'm just gonna talk through the way that Red Canary has built that's worked really well for us and it's been pretty battle tested. So where do you start? So let's start with some terminology because whenever you're talking about anything about cloud, everyone gets really, really confused really, really quickly. You know, no matter how technical you are or non-technical you are, we all use different terms. So you got your cloud, right? It looks exactly like that, we all know that. You got some VMs running inside of your cloud. You've got a database maybe, maybe you've got some storage. You've got all this stuff running inside of a cloud environment. This could be Kubernetes, it could be uh, AWS, it could be Azure. Then sitting on top of, of all of that cloudy goodness, you have what we're calling the cloud control plane. Right? This is what you interact with when you're creating resources. This is the console that you're interacting with to uh, configure security groups, whether that's via an API, whether that's a web UI, whether that's through something like Terraform. So all of your app is running inside of the cloud. That could be your Kubernetes application, that could be the different apps that you're running. And the cloud control plane is what's granting access to those resources and creating those resources. And that's important to kind of draw that separation because what we're really talking about is not what your app is doing. There's a whole different set of techniques that you might want to go into in terms of monitoring what's going on in your apps, monitors what's going on in those VMs. What we're talking about is what the cloud control plane is doing. And so if you take a look at that and you take a step back and say, all right, so that cloud control plane is gonna be spitting out a whole bunch of logging. We call that telemetry, just to keep it separate from logging because logging has, it's one of those, again, overused terms. And so these cloud control planes are spitting out a, a, a record of every single action that's happened to your cloud resources. Right, so anything that's, anytime a resource is created, anytime that a resource has been stopped, anytime the security parameters around those resources, like a firewall or a security group has been changed, you're gonna get a telemetry record surrounding that activity. And you might say, but I only wanna care about Kubernetes logs. Maybe that's something that I wanna focus on. The same idea applies, right? You could take the Kubernetes audit logs or API logs and consider them an the exact same concept here. And these, these principles will still apply. And that's what I'm gonna talk to you is how to break this down. So at the end of this, you're gonna end up with a massive pile of data, right? Hey, this is the haystack to go and go with the tortured metaphor that I'll hit a couple more times during this talk. And so, and then there's you, right? You're trying to wade through this to try to find, hey, is there bad stuff that's happening in my cloud environment? And all you're left with here is the pitchfork. And I'm gonna talk about the pitchfork today because we'll just carry that metaphor a little bit farther. So let's talk about ways to dig through that haystack. So our philosophy at Red Canary has been to kind of follow the Unix philosophy of old. And this will make sense here in a second. Write programs that do one thing and do it well. Write programs to work together. And this last one is a bit of a stretch, but it still works. Write, write programs to handle text streams because that is a universal interface. Right, this is from Doug, Doug McElroy, the inventor of Unix pipes. Right, if you've ever used Unix, Linux, I suspect you all have, 
the command line arguments are all super, super simple. They're not overcomplicated, but you pipe them all together to get the results that you want. That's the same approach that we've taken here. You could say, I'll just build one monolithic process that'll go through all these things and do all this stuff together. You can do that, but then you lose all the composability that I'm gonna talk about here in a second. So what are those blocks that I'm talking about? When you're trying to wade through all of this data, you start with ingest, then you're gonna go into standardize, then you're gonna go into combine, detect, suppress, and respond. I'm gonna talk about all of these in detail next. I'm just kind of setting the stage right now. For us, each, each of these boxes is a separate Kubernetes deployment that we're running. I'm gonna talk about first the concepts of it, and then I'm gonna talk about the technologies that we use and, and the choices that you might make if you're trying to build something similar. So let me dive into each one of these step by step. But before I do that, I just took a problem and I broke it down into six boxes. And I just said I have a whole bunch of different Kubernetes deployments that handle that. Well, now you gotta talk about moving data around, right? The second you divide the problem, you could just create another problem is, oh, now I gotta get data from this computer to this computer. So there's a number of different ways that you can solve this problem and moving this data around at scale. And the at scale part is critical. From a Red Canary standpoint, we're processing six billion logs a day. I doubt any of you are gonna be handling that volume of data, but if you're doing anything for your organization, that data volume will escalate really, really quickly because in the cloud, you can do stuff really, really, really quickly and you don't expect it. So I would encourage you to start thinking at scale even if you're starting small. So we use something super simple. We use S3 buckets and then you tack on an SNS topic and then you tack on an SQS queue. And you might look at that and say, but there's way cooler, fancier things out there like Kafka and you might wanna use Kinesis or all these other cool technologies. And we have used those and they're complex. And there's nothing wrong with using those, but it required more management overhead. There's something simple about writing a file to an S3 bucket, or if you're in Azure, an, an Azure blob store, or in GKE, or GCE, G, GCP, the, I even forgot what they call it, GCP, a bucket, effectively, right? And writing it out, because then, by having a file notification that comes out every single time you write a file, something down, downstream can subscribe to that and you can tee off as many places as you want, and it requires almost no management on your part. That's really powerful, because you're gonna have enough details to worry about with everything else that I'm talking through here. You don't wanna worry boring about how to move data around, right? So I saw this is super simple. It's super cheap, relatively speaking, right? It's just, it's just S3 data storage, and you could add lifecycle rules to age out that old data, so you don't have to worry about cleaning it up afterwards. When you screw it up, and there is a when you screw it, not if, when you screw it up, those files are still sitting there, and then you can replay them through whatever process or engine that you have going through there. And allow, this allows you to tee off as many components as you want, and this will become more relevant later on when I go, go through here. So, now back to those boxes that I was showing you. So, the very first step in this chain is ingesting the data. In our context, what this means is we're literally just taking that log output, that telemetry stream, and we're just writing them into files in S3, and we're putting them with a specific file name. That's it. You could say, well, we could do more fancy things in this particular phase. We'll go back to that original Unix pipes idea of don't. Keep this super simple. Make this as simple as you can just to shuttle data around. Right? This could be an opportunity where you might wanna filter out the data that you don't care about because you're gonna get a lot of data that you don't care about that you don't realize you don't care about until someone does something like scan their data lake and all of a sudden you get a bazillion S3 reads coming in on this telemetry stream, 99.9% .9 you don't care about and don't pose any real threat to your environment but now you gotta wade through them. So over time you might gonna start to drop in those filters to reduce the data volume that you have coming in but this is just a chance for you to shuttle data around. And every cloud provider has their way of writing their data out to a file. And you can take your Kubernetes logs and you can stream them to a file using a couple different open source tools as well. So the goal here is just get the data into your data processing pipeline. Because then you can do more things with it. Because the next step you may hate, but you might want to be able to replay that data over and over again. Once again, it's sitting in files, it's easy to do that. So the next step is standardize. And you might say, but why do I want to standardize this data? And I would agree with that. But when I say standardize, what I'm really talking about is getting them all into a consistent format. And let me explain why. So let's say you start with AWS. I, we, we are mostly an AWS shop, so that's mostly what I re refer to, to start with. 
But then your boss says, hey, you know what? Multi-cloud is super cool and all the cool kids are doing it now. Let's add Google to the fun, all right? So now you add Google in there and now, you've got, now you're processing AWS and Google telemetry. And then your CISO says, hey, you know what? We want Okta telemetry in there too because we want to find out who's authenticating into this particular cloud. We have SSO, we tie those things together. Awesome. Then you throw in Netscope because why not? You could throw in whatever you want. You could add your Kubernetes logs in here. You throw in Azure and before you know it, you have five different log formats. And I guarantee you, if you're doing this well, you'll end up adding more log formats and you won't really get a vote in the matter. So you can come back to the question of saying, well, then why standardize? Why are we spending the time to do that? Well, because there's no one way to do this. So just in a quick look of the five examples that I had up there, I looked at the telemetry formats of every single one of them. In AWS, IP address comes in as source IP address. Okay, cool, that makes sense, I'm okay with that. In Azure, it comes in as IP address. All right, at least the same substring is in there. In GCP, it's called caller IP. All, all right, that's yet a third variant of IP address. Then Okta calls it IP address, but it's now it's lowercase or lower camel case, whatever. It's different than the way we did Azure. And then in Netscope, it's just IP. And I guarantee you, if you pick five more log formats, they're gonna have five more different formats. And this is just IPv4. I don't even know what IPv6 comes in through here, and I don't even wanna even think about that. So later on, and this is a later on as I talk through this, if you're gonna try to write detection logic and look for malicious IPs that you know are bad, because obviously 192.0.2.1 is a malicious IP, your logic is gonna have to look like this in your code. And then you're gonna add another log format and you're gonna have to add yet another string into this if, if statement. And this gets more and more complicated the more and more formats you add in, right? And so this might be a phase that you wanna skip because you, you know what, I'm just gonna start with AWS, it'll be great. But before you know it, you've added more log formats. So if you can standardize this data at the edge, the rest of your life is gonna be way, way easier downstream. So what do you standardize to? Well, this has the obligatory XKCD reference of standards and what standards you wanna pick. This is probably my favorite one. Red Canary uses our own internal standard because that's what we did, but we also built our standard like 10 years ago and that's what it is. So what seems to be winning now in this space is OCSF, the Open Cyber Security, the Open Cyber Security Schema Framework. But two years from now, there could be another flavor of the week. What I would advocate is don't make your own. If there's one that already exists out there, just use it. And if it doesn't quite suit your needs, extend it to be how you need to. So let's just use OCSF for an example for right now. So you take all those different IP address formats. And again, I just picked one field, right? I didn't talk about date time. I didn't talk about IPv6. You pick your field. It's all going to have a different name. And then if you looked in the OCSF format, it's source IP. All right, fine, it's yet another variant, but at least it's one variant. So now my detection logic downstream is one if statement. I don't have a block of five ors and ands and weird ways that I have to concatenate those things together. And that might seem really, really trivial, but if you have thousands of detectors that you wanna write, it's all an order of magnitude complexity that you're combining together. And so you really have to think about this in terms of take the time to standardize the data up front because it's gonna be hurt you a lot more later on. All right. That was one of my favorite topics is talking about standardizing data. Let's talk about combining data. So everything up until this point has been totally stateless. And that's one of the cool things about just shuttling data around. I think of this as a bucket brigade. Every single one of these components grabs data, does something to it, it moves it downstream. And if they die midstream, cool. With our SQS architecture, it doesn't really matter. The next pod will come up, we'll grab the message, we'll shuttle the data downstream. It's all been stateless. That's the way you're supposed to be in the cloud. But guess what? You need some state somewhere. So that's what this combine bit is. And so there's a number of different ways that you can do this, but the idea is to take those pieces of information that you're getting and integrate them over time in some data store. It's up to you what that could be. That could just be S3, although I think if you're gonna to try to query it, it could become cost prohibitive. We use OpenSearch because that's a database that we can pummel the crap out of and get the data out really, really effectively. But you can pick the data store that you want. You could use Redis, you can use anything that you kind of want in that particular space. But the idea is you need a place to store this to look over time. Because in looking for these threats, it's never a single event that's the key to that, that something went wrong, right? And so a good example of this, and I, I like to use myself, 
Every single time I use the AWS CLI, I am wrong. I get an access denied the first time, mostly because I forgot to auth for the day. Our, our SSO tokens expire and I forgot to re-auth. Or maybe I'm signed into the wrong account. Or maybe I can't type and I type the wrong resource on the command line. Any one of those events in isolation looks like it might be a threat. But really, those are just a bunch of false positives that don't actually mean anything. And you don't really want to send out the dogs on one particular user that has a lot of typo problems and can't remember to auth for the day. You need to look at those behaviors over time to see, oh, user Brian Davis has failed to auth 50 times. That's more than his normal incompetence with the AWS CLI. That might be something suspicious that's going on. But the key is you have to have that data in some sort of state to combine it together to look over time. So, the, the state, this state combined uh, part of the pipeline doesn't do anything other than aggregate it together. And I'll get to what the, what the next phase is here. So like I said, you have a data store like Redis or OpenSearch where you're just writing these records in that then moves on to the next phase, which is detect. Right? So the combine is literally combining it together. Again, keep it simple. It does one thing. Every sing single time a new, a new piece of data is written to the combine phase, we emit a message downstream and say, okay, detect, how about now? Why don't you check now? And so now the detect component is gonna go back and query that data store and say, okay, I now have a new piece of information. Should I go and look for maybe new threats that are associated with that? And this is where we start talking about things like detectors. So maybe I have two detectors that I've written. The first one that I show here, and these are actual detectors that we use at Red Canary that we've published on our blog, and I, there's, I can give you some more resources about this later on, is, hey, maybe there's an instance, uh, an, uh, an AWS instance, that's trying to create a resource in the cloud. That's a behavior that I don't necessarily want to have happen. That seems kind of suspicious. In this particular case, it might be kind of a one-shot deal where that, that's one action. But the one below it is, hey, maybe I have an AWS instance credential that's trying to do a get, list, and describe, and it gets an access to deny more than three times within five minutes. Oh, that's one of those states over time. And that's what I've highlighted here with those kind of those red marks of saying, hey, now you can start to look over time at the behaviors that you don't necessarily want to have happen with that combined state. And this combined state can age off after five minutes, 24 hours, whatever period of time that you think is appropriate. So in this particular example, Detector 2 fired and said, hey, you know what, I found something that was relevant. So there's two quick points I want to make on this. You have the combined stage that's writing a whole bunch of data into this data store. You have the detect phase that's reading a whole bunch of data from this data store. You're going to be pummeling the crap out of this data store. So whatever you use, it's got to be able to take a beating. And so that's a really important thing. And I know this because we've beaten the crap out of our own data stores a lot. And that's been one of the big challenges that we've had from a scalability standpoint. Because remember, all it takes is someone to do a data lake scan and suddenly your data store is getting pummeled with the data coming in. So just be prepared that these two phases together are really somewhat abusive to any data store you throw in the middle there. And the second point that I wanted to make is let's say that you've got a team of, of engineers that are really good at putting these piece parts together, but maybe they don't specialize in security. Or maybe you've got some folks that are really, really good at finding the threats in the cloud, but they're not so good at the rest of the infrastructure piece. The cool thing about this design is that you can have your team of security specialists live in this detect box. They don't necessarily need to know how the data moves around. They don't need to know S3. They don't need to know how databases work they can focus on writing detectors, and that's all that they do. And actually, at Red Canary, that's what we do. We have a kind of a product engineering side that's building the pipeline, and the detection engineering side, and they're focused on building the detectors. They're looking at threats that are in the cloud, and they don't need to know how the rest of the system works. They're looking at how do I string these things together? What are the things that a threat actor might be doing that I care about? And they don't care about all the moving parts about how those detectors get to fire. And that can become really, really powerful, especially if you've got a small team or you want to have some folks that are working more on the infrastructure side and some folks that are working more on the security side. And the last part is that this type of detector logic is what you can get from the open source community. This is what's available in blog posts. This is what's available as threat indicators from different companies, Red Canary included. I sat in a talk by Dakota Riley yesterday from Acquia, and he went through a number of, the, uh, of uh, threat indicators that you could find in Kubernetes. That's the type of information that you can say, oh, cool, I'm going to go bake that into my detect logic, 
and I don't have to change anything else in my pipeline because all I know is, oh, I'm looking for this source IP, I'm looking for this particular timeline, I'm looking for these actions that you've standardized to your own nomenclature. All right, so then the next step may seem a little bit confusing because you've got this suppress box. So your detect component may be spit out five different detections, right? Because they hit on those various conditions that we set in here. The suppress step is this secondary filter to say, you know what? We want our detectors to be super, super sensitive, but we want to avoid repeat investigations into what's going on. And that's important because your detector, you want to be sensitive. You want to be able to light it up whenever something remotely suspicious is going on in your environment. But maybe you know that Ted always shells into a Kubernetes pod and pokes around because that's what he does on, his, on the weekends. Maybe you know that maybe this came from the dev environment and you don't actually care about what's happening here because that's the, dev, that's the set of dev IP addresses. You don't want to tune your detector to ignore that because the detector fired for the right reasons. That could have been malicious behavior. But this is a secondary suppression step to say, okay, you know what? As a finer grained tuning, I'm going to exclude these conditions. And that allows you a secondary knob that you can adjust very, very easily to say, all right, you know what? Out of those five detectors that I fired, only, th only two of them were worth going and investigating. And having that as something separate from your detector logic is really, really powerful because that can be adjusted by different individuals depending on how they're going through things. And lastly, you've got this response stage. And I kind of left this, this chart particularly blank because this is gonna vary by every single organization. Right? At this stage, you've found two detections that may very well have some sort of malicious activity that need investigation. But what that investigation is going to look like is going to completely vary by each of your organizations. Right? That might be that you build a UI on top of this so that you can surface these to your security operations center. That might be that you automate logic to go out and fetch more context from that data store that we had upstream to build context to give to an analyst to go and do that investigation. Maybe you just page someone, right? It can really, really vary. But at this point, you've now whittled it down into two things that might be legit threats in your environment that you need to go take care of. So that's going to really vary in terms of what is going to suit your particular enterprise and how you want to handle these particular pieces of information. So going back to that haystack metaphor, because I can't beat this dead horse enough, right? you start with that pile of, of cloud control plane logs, telemetry, whatever logs you want to pump into this. And in each phase, you're reducing this down smaller and smaller until you've got to threats requiring investigation. Right? We don't want to say that the detection logic is actually going to say this is an actual threat. There's really no way that you can do that without a human going and taking a look and saying, yep, that actually does look like a threat. And if it isn't a threat, you go tune those suppression rules so that it doesn't come back out again. It doesn't have repeat investigation. But now you've, you've whittled down all of that data into something that's actionable that you can go do something about. So that's the concept of these different blocks. But now how do you build these things? So, there's a number of ways that you can go build all these components, right? So as you step through the runtime framework, right, we're, we're basically at a Kubernetes conference. Kubernetes is a great runtime framework to do this in, but you don't have to run this in Kubernetes. You could use something like a, a serverless framework that's out there. You could use Apache Spark if your team knows how to use that. It really is whatever the best tool that your team or you know how to use in order to put these things together. Right? There's no right answer, and this is kind of where I started from. If you break it down into these building blocks, you can use any framework that suits you to put these things together. We use Kubernetes, and we're running it on Amazon EKS and Azure AKS. Back in the olden days, we hand-rolled our own Kubernetes cluster, and we're happy to not do that ever again. And so we're happy using the, the cloud providers one. But each one of these components is an independently scalable uh, deployment in our Kubernetes environment, which is great because in, at different parts, you'll back up in different ways. And if you scale them accordingly, that allows you to work off that queue. And we're running everything on spot instances because that saves us a whole bunch of money, right? Because the idea of every single one of these is stateless, if a node goes out from underneath us, we don't really care. We drop that state, we'll just move on again uh, in some other context, except for that combined stage, which is running out in, in Amazon OpenSearch. So you can say, okay, but great, my team only knows Java. My team only knows Python. It doesn't matter. You can write this in any language that makes sense. Uh, Perl does not make sense. So what do we use? So as an example of what language should you use this in, 
We wrote ours in Ruby. Ruby is not the first language you think of when you think, I'm going to write a really big data processor. Ruby is not efficient in that respect. But Ruby was fast, not in terms of processing speed, but fast for our engineers to write. Our engineers knew Ruby. And Ruby, you can crank out a lot of code super, super fast. And as a startup, that was really, really important to us. However, as we got more mature, we recognized, oh, you know what? Go is a fast language compared to Ruby, which is not a runtime fast language. So we ported a lot of our really slow data processing components over to Go instead. But you can write this in any language that you want. And with each of these being an independently deployable component, you can mix and match. I mean, there's obvious design consequences to having a polyglot system in your environment. But if you wanted to write some in Python and some in Ruby and some in Go, there's nothing stopping you from doing that. You've got the standardized language that you're using. If you're using OCSF, there's probably languages that parse that in every single, uh, in every single language that's out there. All right, so what, what are you going to use from an infrastructure standpoint? So I talked about before that you have the messaging problem of sending the data between all these boxes. Kafka is an obvious choice, and Kafka is a great choice. You could use things like RabbitMQ. You could use buckets, topics, and queues, which is what we use. That's what I talked about before. You might have infrastructure as code problems that you have to go deal with, because now you've got to go deploy things in between. So one of the challenges of using S3 buckets is in between each one of these components, we have to have an S3 bucket, an SNS topic, and an SQS queue. That's kind of draconian to go and create by hand. You certainly can a handful of times. But we use Terraform. And that way, every single time we spin out a component, we just drop another Terraform module out there, and it spits out all these components for us. So you can use any particular infrastructure as code that you want. You can use any sort of in, uh, infrastructure to move the data around. My, my recommendation is go as simple as you possibly can. You have enough things to deal with. And a lot of these things are not necessarily complicated problems to solve. The engineer in all of us wants to go and make them complicated because that's really fun. But sometimes boring is really, really good. All right, but then some other cats and dogs, scaling, monitoring deployment, the small cats and dogs that you throw out there. Right? How are you going to scale these components up? Because you're going to have to, because you're going to get a lot of data, and you don't know when you're going to get a lot of data. How are you going to monitor when they fail? And that's an important thing of when, not if. They're all going to fail, and they're all going to fail at the worst possible time. Um, and how are you going to get these things out there? How are you going to deploy these components into your environment? Depending on the runtime framework you're using, some of these you might get baked in. Some of these you won't. Right, for us, we're using Kata scaling uh, on SQS queue depth for all those components. We're using Prometheus and Grafana to monitor what's going on. We're using Argo CD. And a lot of this just becomes set it and forget it, which is great. We commit our code, and magically it appears, unless it doesn't, and we have to go fight with it. And then we create these dashboards so that we have insight into what's going on inside of this. Because the problem now is you have a lot of moving parts. So you need to understand, where are we along this chain? Where are things backing up? Is there something that's not working? This is an actual dashboard that we have that we can see. And you can see we've got 58 components of our ingester, 13 components of our standardizer. We have 54 of our combiner. Right? So they all scale independently depending on the data needs that we have going through the system. So now that you've got all this runtime components, and I know that I've gone through this super, super fast, and a lot of detail has just been glossed over, and I'm more than happy to answer questions afterwards. But what does this mean if you're going to build a system like this? What does this mean if this is how you want to process your data? So if you look at that pipeline, and I put the little buckets in between here as, as an example, this starts to give you a tremendous amount of flexibility over time. And I go back to that Unix methodology of build, some, build composable things that are really, really simple, and they do one thing well. Well, if this is what your pipeline looks like, now you can start to modify it to hang off different things along the way. So let's just say that you want to build a data lake, because that's what all the cool kids are doing now. Well, that's easy. You just hang a component off of the bucket that standardized your data and say, you know what, I'm going to pipe that into my data lake, because that's what I want to do. And then you say, well, you know what, all the cool kids are really doing AI. Data lakes are so last week. Cool. Now you hang an AI component off of a different bucket. And this is really easy in this architecture, because you just hang another SQS queue off the SNS topic. If you're in Kafka, you just hang another, oh, I'm going to get this wrong, another consumer group off of the topic. Oh, I haven't used Kafka in a while. But the idea being that you can then fork this however you need to to suit whatever your organization's needs are that grows over time. Or you might say, oh, you know what? I messed up this data along the way because I did something wrong. I rolled a bad deployment, or the standardizer was, had misspelled the word IP address. 
Well, now you can replay that data. And whatever message, or whatever message bus that you're using, I would encourage you to have it durable enough that you can push data back through there again because you're going to need to push data back through there again. Or you might say, you know what? I want to try a different suppressor in my data pipeline. Cool, you can hang it off of the side and you can experiment to see what it is. When I told you before that we ported our engine from Ruby to Go, we had the entire thing running in parallel and we could compare the, the apples and oranges between the two of them. And we could do it in a non-destructive way because we could just fork the data path anywhere along the way and it allowed us to do that. So it's super, super powerful to have this composability and to have that durability of the message bus. And again, I go back to, because they're just files sitting in an S3 bucket, they're super easy to deal with if and when you screw something up to go back and do it again or to look at the output and say, oh, what did I get? This is a little bit different than what I expected. The fancier message buses, you can do that, but you have to have tooling to go in there as opposed to just pulling things from files. So really, the, the bottom line of all this is to, if you're gonna look for these threats in your cloud environment, if you wanna build a pipeline like this, break down the problem. Right? If you digest it into these blocks, again, this is how we do it. Your mileage may vary with how you want to do it, but create some simple modular blocks that scale. And use the cloud native building blocks. Right? There's a lot of basic, basic, boring tech out there that you could just deploy with a couple mouse clicks. Sure, you could do something fancy and deploy something into Kubernetes and it's gonna be really awesome, but SQS messages, as boring as they are, are really, really easy to deploy and relatively cost effective. And then the last one, and this is really about the key takeaway, is leverage the community around you. There's a lot of people doing really cool research here. And as long as you have the ability to implement that, that knowledge into your system, you can leverage all the work that everyone else is doing because there's no way that your security team can do that research all in one, in one fell swoop. But if you can take the knowledge that everybody in the community is doing and take those uh, threat indicators and combine them into the way that you're looking for threats, that gives you a tremendous amount of power. So on that note, I covered an awful lot of ground and I've got like two minutes left. I wanted to open up for any questions and if people have additional questions, you can hit me up afterwards. There's my LinkedIn and Twitter contact information, as well as the Red Canary blog, which has a whole bunch of this stuff. So with that, does anyone have any questions that they want to fire off in our last few minutes? Yes, sir. Do you have like a magic number for um, log sources that where you say this is starting to make sense? You know, your small organization of three, maybe not 300, yes. Is, is there a sort of like a benchmark? Uh, in terms of how many log sources that you want to consume? I would say one, and only because the second you add one, someone's gonna come along and say, let's add another one. And now you've already written your detection logic to work for that one log source that you took in, and now you're gonna have to go and make two modifications. And I know it seems very counterintuitive, and you're, you know, again, your organization, your mileage may vary, but if you start and say, you know what, we're gonna go ahead and take everything and convert it to this common format, that means all, everything beyond that point won't have to change when you add another log format in there, in theory. Yes, sir. Do you have a recommended resources for mastering detection engineering? I mean, it's easy to come up with some simple queries and the stuff that you think of, but any like, useful GitHub repos or blog posts? You... Um, so I'll be biased here, and I'll point you to the Red Canary blog. And I'll also say that uh, that is less my area of expertise and more the area of the detection engineers that, that Red Canary has. Um, I, I do believe that if you search out there for companies like Red Canary and our competitors that are out there, there's a wealth of knowledge out there. The threat intelligence reports that everybody puts out every year contain a lot of the detection logic that's in there, and that's a good start. And if you want to hit me up later, I might be able to connect you with some of the folks in my company that have more knowledge in that particular area. Yeah. Yes, in the back. So the question is, can we combine the standardized and the ingest inside of like FluentD or something that's farther upstream? You, you absolutely can, right? And again, this, was the, uh, this is our way of doing it. I would advise against combining the standardization logic only because, especially if you have it deployed remotely in some sort of far-flung environment, updating it gets a lot harder. 
And that's one of the reasons why having the ingest literally just be, I'm moving data from here to here, and that's all that it does. It gives you a lot more, more ability because now that data is here and it's local to you or it's easier for you to access, especially if you need to change your standardization logic. Obviously, you can combine the two together and they're design trades everywhere along this pipeline. But I would advise more composability if you have the, the flexibility to do that. But obviously, I don't know your specific environment well enough to know if that would make sense. OK. So in that, case, in that case, yeah, you could add the standardization logic. I mean, like, like I said, with everything, you could combine all this stuff together into one. It just limits your flexibility downstream, and it's going to depend on your specific use case. I think probably last question, yes. That's a great question. So the question was, where do we do enrichment? And, and the answer is, it varies. Sometimes we put it in ingest, even though we say don't do anything in ingest. Sometimes we put it in standardized, because like, well, if we're already here, we're modifying the data, we can just reach out to, it, to an enricher. More often than not, we inject another box in between standardize and combine, so that before we put it into the combiner, we'll reach out to an enrichment service. So and it depends on which engine path we have in our particular product. We can go out and hit IPQS in order to try to find the IP quality score. We can go out to VirusTotal and try to find information about binaries that are coming in for our EDR, MDR products. And so it really will, will vary, but in that particular case, we frequently found that injecting another box, another step in this pipeline is a really good way to do that. And this architecture allows you to add that enrichment step in such a way that you're not really destructive to the overall process path. The real trick about enrichment, especially if you're processing data at this volume, is making sure you get the response back fast enough that you don't back up the entire pipeline. And so you have to make some interesting design trades accordingly about the way that you call services and the way that you return things. And there's some tricks that we can do. I'm happy to ch uh, ch chat with you afterwards if you'd like. On that note, I think we're out of time. If you guys have more questions, feel free to come hit me up. We can talk more. Hit me up on LinkedIn. Um, and thank you guys. I really appreciate it.